Hello, welcome to another episode of the RPG and Go tutorial series. Today we're going to be covering combat. But before we do that, I thought it was about time that we start organizing some code. Uh, so if you're here just for the combat section of this and you're not really following the series to a T, then I recommend skipping to the timestamp in the description to get started with that. Um, but for those of y'all that do want to follow the series exactly, um, I'm going to be organizing some parts of this. Specifically, I'm going to be moving the game struct into its own file to clean up the entry point of the application, and I'm also going to start using constants instead of just random numbers throughout the program. So that'll hopefully help things out here. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So the first thing is that we have a really big main file and honestly, it's kind of hard to navigate and I've noticed in my videos that I'm jumping around a little too much with the main file because there's just so much going on. One thing that we can do is we can pull out the game struct um, because there's no reason that we actually define our game inside of the main file here. It was just for convenience in the beginning of the series. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just cut out my game like this and then I'm going to create a new file here and so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut out my game like this, and then I'm going to create a new file here. I'm going to call it my game.go. Um, inside of here, I will create the, I'll put the package main at the top to specify that we're in the main package, and then I will paste the game struct here. We're gonna have um, a lot of errors here because of the imports, but hopefully you have some import resolvers in your editor. Um, if not, you can just you know manually do it one by one. Um, but it should just be the same imports that you had in the main file as well. So we can go a step further with this and we can just start pulling out the game, um, the game struct methods like update and draw into that same file. So I'm going to do that here. Now there's one more thing we can do. We can pull all of this initialization code into a sort of constructor style function for our game. Um, and so I'm going to do that here. I'm gonna go into game.go and right after the definition, I'm gonna create a new function. So func take in g uh, game here. And this is going to be, I'm gonna call it new game. And that's kind of a convention inside of Go. Basically, whenever you want to create like a constructor style function to create a new a new object of that struct, you basically put new and then the name of the struct. So we're doing new game here. And then this is going to create um, a reference to a game object here. So like that. And then what we can do is we can go into main.go here. We can just grab everything that is relative to initializing a game. So all of our image loading and the actual creation of the struct itself. So I will cut all of that out. I will go into the game file here. I will go inside this new game function and paste it inside of there. We gotta resolve a couple more input ports for ebitan util and log fatal. Uh, we're log fataling here inside of a function because if we don't create a new game, well, we can't really we can't really run the game. So that's that's gotta happen. We're not, we're gonna keep that as the same. We're gonna keep that the same as it normally is there. And so now instead we can just replace this. Um, we can replace all that stuff with just game uh, with just game colon equals, and then we want to do a new game here. And we're getting an undefined here. I'm not really sure why. Oh, right. It should not be a method of the <laughs> game class. I don't know why I did that. Um, it should just be a function that creates a new game object. And also now we don't, we no longer uh, provide a reference to game because, because the new game function returns a pointer to a game object. So we just get rid of that. And now we should be good to go. So there you go. Um, our main file is a little bit cleaner. One more thing that I do want to add is I want to add a section for constants so that we're no longer just throwing 16 around everywhere. Instead, we're actually defining it somewhere. So I'm gonna create a new folder, constants, and then inside of there, I'm just gonna put you know a file of the same name. So constants slash constants.go here. And I'm gonna go inside of there and I'm going to put it inside of the package of constants. And I'm just going to create a const block here. So we do const block, everything inside of here is a constant. And then I will say that the tile size is equal to uh, 16 like that. So from now on, wherever we use 16, we can actually replace it with tile size. And I'm gonna do that off camera because that's very boring. That'll be that'll be up reflected in the GitHub repository later. So now onto combat. So in order to actually implement combat, we need to know what we need. So what do we need to actually create a combat system? Uh, for me, that will involve a couple different things. One, we need to know the health of the player and the enemies. We also need to know the attack power of the player and the enemies, and maybe some other things for down the line. Um, but for now, we'll keep it very, very simple, and we'll just keep those two things in mind. Um, and so what I wanna do is I wanna introduce a new part of our system here. We have been working strictly with like sort of monolithic entities, but now we're going to be implementing something new, and that is going to be our components. 
So I'm gonna create a new folder called components and inside of there, I'm going to create a new component called a combat component. So I'm just gonna make a combat.go file here for that, save it and let's go inside of there. So we'll make this our package components like this and let's actually implement our new, our new combat component. So we're gonna make a type combat and now we have to think about what data type should this be. Um, so for me, I think the the thing I wanna reach for right away because I'm working with uh, Go is I wanna reach for an interface. And the reason that I'm using an interface here is because interfaces are very, very flexible. So later down the line, when I wanted to add uh, more dynamic things, we could feasibly achieve that rather than if I used a concrete struct, I would have some issues with having things work a little bit differently. Now let's go ahead and create that combat component. So I'm going to create a new interface here. So it's gonna be a combat interface. And since we said that our you know, initial MVP, our minimal viable product of a combat component would be that we have an attack power and we have health, we're going to have at least these two getters. So we'll have our health getter here. And I'm just going to say that our health is an, is an int here. Um, and then I'm going to say, let's say attack power is also going to be um, an int here. Um, but as it stands with this, these are just two getters. Um, and so this would be like a read only sort of struct, but we want to actually mutate things whenever we attack our enemies. So what we want to do is we want to say that we can damage. Um, and whenever we damage here, we're going to say like amount. So this will basically subtract from the health this amount. So that is a very, very basic implementation of a combat interface. Um, but we can't use this interface directly inside of our struct without having to implement these functions first. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do this very simple pattern where we have an interface and then we create a basic implementation of it for most things to use. And then whenever we want something that, for example, when you damage it, it only deals half, then we can implement like a super strong combat or whatever, whatever we wanna call it. So what I'm to do is I'm going to create a basic combat here and this is just going to be a struct and this struct will implement all of those fields. So the first thing is we need those fields so we have the health and then we have the attack power like this which is also an int and then I'm going to use this cool trick that I can use which is a quick fix thing so I can say var underscore combat and this is going to be equal to and then in parentheses you create a pointer to a basic combat object and then at the end you um, put this nil at the end and it will give you this error here which you can then say if you have it in uh, a modern IDE, it will allow you to declare the missing methods of combat. So then I'm going to do that here. And as you can see, I got cool Rust-like trait autocompletion for my interfaces. So that's pretty cool. So I'm just going to do a little bit of cleaning up here. I'm gonna remove these comments that don't really tell you anything. And then I'm going to actually return B dot, um, and then it was attack power here, or not, not that. And then I'm going to um, return B dot health for for the health struct here, or for the health function there, and then I'm going to return b dot attack power for that one, and I'm going to uh, put the getters together because I think that that makes more sense. So like that, and there you go. Our basic combat thing has been done, except we have to do one more thing. We can say b dot health, and then we can say um, minus equals the amount like that. So now we've laid out the framework for how we can um, implement some combat, some basic combat for here. And so the way we can actually utilize this is that we can go where we are defining our player and we can actually attach this component onto our player. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to attach a component to our player. I'm going to say that this is our combat component here. So our combat component, and then I'm going to say that that is going to be a um, pointer to, and then we're going to go inside of our combat, our components module, and then inside of there, I'm going to imp I'm going to append the basic combat for the player. What I can then do is go into the enemy as well, and we can do the exact same thing. So I'm going to say uh, combat component, and this is going to be a pointer to go inside of the components basic combat. So the basic combat like that. So now, so now each enemy has a basic combat 
component and the player has a basic combat component. Bit of a mouthful, but there you go. Now let's go ahead and go into our game and let's, let's create like a rough implementation of a system that can act between the player and the enemy for all these different things. Also, I just realized that inside of our new game function, instead of, you know, assigning game to this game thing, we need to actually return, um, return the game like this. Okay, so now what we need to do is find the update method inside of our game.go. And after we do all of our collision checks and all that sort of stuff, let's go ahead and tackle some uh, fighting stuff. Okay, so now we're in the update method where after we handled all of our movement collisions and we're before we did the potion stuff, I've commented it out because the print statements are a little bit annoying. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the first step. I'm going to I'm going to make it so that when I click on an enemy, it subtracts from their health until they have no more health, in which case they get removed from the enemy pool. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to check some state. We need to make sure that we are one, clicking, and two, that our cursor is on that enemy. And so for that, I'm just going to capture it here. So I'm gonna say uh, click colon equals, then it's going to be ebiten util. And then I think it's called, what is it? Um, is mouse, or is it mouse? Or no, it's not ebiten util. It's colon equals input util dot is mouse button just pressed. And then we pass in ebiten dot mouse button zero. The next thing that we need to grab is we need to grab the X and the Y position of the cursor whenever we clicked. So we're gonna do CX and we're gonna do CY and this is going to be colon equals and then we want to do ebiten dot, I think it's like mouse position. It might be util, mouse, cursor, it might be cursor. It might be cursor, so I'm gonna do that. Cursor position like that, there we go. This returns to an X and a Y value for that. So that's good there. And now what we need to do is we need to basically just loop over enemies and check if one of them is colliding with that mouse. So we'll say for underscore enemy uh, colon equals range g dot enemies like this. And then inside of there, we need to check collisions between an enemy, between the enemy's rect and the point. Now, as of right now, the enemy does not have a defined rectangle, and we're kind of assuming that each enemy is one tile by one tile in size. And so what we can do is we can construct a hitbox out of the enemy's X and Y position, plus that uh, tile size by tile size um, constraint that we made. So I'm going to do that here. I'm gonna say our rect is going to be equal to, and this is going to be the image.rect function here, which takes in four values. Um, the first is going to be the enemy.x here, um, and then the next is going to be the enemy.y uh, here, so like that. And then what we're gonna do is I'm just going to take those values, I'm gonna paste them down below, and then I'm going to add that con that new constant that we introduced. So I'm gonna do plus, and that's gonna be constants dot tile size like this. Should be like that, yeah, there we go. And that's how we construct our rec there. And then we need to do an if statement that where we check if the cursor is within the rect. So the way we can do that is we can say if, and then we wanna say if um, CX is greater than rect.min.x, and then we need to do an and statement here. So we need to say and um, CX is less than, I think it's less than or equal to, could be less than or equal to, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. We don't, we don't really care about extreme position right now. It's more for the example. So we're gonna say if, then we're gonna do an and, and then we're gonna say CX is less than uh, the rect.max.x the rect.max.x here. Uh, so that is checking on the x-axis. The next thing we need to do is check on the y-axis. So we're gonna say and, and then we're gonna do cy is greater than uh, the rect.min.y here, and the cy is less than the rect.max.y here. So in other words, this is saying, this is saying is cursor in rect, that's all it's saying. If the cursor is in the rect and we have clicked, we can say then if we have clicked, what we want to do is we want to subtract from that enemy's health. So we'll say enemy and we'll say dot combat component dot damage here, and then we want to damage it by the player's amount. So g dot player dot, and then we need to do the attack power, the, the uh, combat component dot attack power like that. And then we need to do another check, and we need to say if enemy dot combat component dot health is less than or equal to zero, 
Then we need to actually kill the enemy here. If our enemy's uh, health is less than zero, um, we want to actually remove that enemy from the list. Um, but we can't really do that while we're looping over the enemies because that could lead to undefined behavior. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to keep a separate list of dead enemies. And then we're going to check later on if that list has been populated at all. If it has, remove all the entries in the main list that are contained inside of the dead enemy list. We're gonna create a new variable called dead enemies here. And this is going to be equal to, we're going to do the make syntax and we're going to make it a map of int for the indexes. And then for the value, I'm gonna do a struct here. And the reason is because a struct has a, a size of zero. So all we're gonna be checking is, is this index in the map? We don't actually care about the value. We just want a way to make a kind of sparse array sort of thing here. So um, now what we can do is we can say that whenever the component's health is less than zero, we want to add it to the dead enemies. So we'll say um, dead enemies at the index, which I haven't defined um, yet. I need to go up here and I, I need to change this to index like that. And then I can add it to here so I can say this is equal to just an empty struct like this. So this is definitely some interesting syntax, but it's basically just but it's basically just creating a completely empty struct so that we can hold it inside of our map. Finally, now we can do this. We can say if the length of dead enemies is uh, you know greater than zero, so we'll say greater than uh, zero here. Then what we wanna do is we want to create a new list of enemies and swap out the old one for the new one. So we can do that here. We can say that new enemies, um, we can say new enemies is equal to, and then we want to create a new, we wanna create a new slice of enemies here. So entities.enemy, and then we want to put in that zero here. So it's a new slice. And then we loop over all the enemies. So for index enemy, colon equals range g dot enemies. And then we'll say if, and we want to do um, underscore exists, uh, and then we want to do colon equals dead enemies at the index. And then we want to say semicolon um, does not exist. Then we want to add it to the new enemy. So new enemies equals append this new enemy here. Finally, when that's all done, g.enemies equals the new enemies, like that. So that was quite a bit of code. Basically what it's doing is we're creating an empty slice of enemies and then we're looping over the enemies and if that list is, if that index is inside of the map of dead enemies that we created by looping over it in the beginning here, um, then we want to ignore it. Otherwise, if it is not inside of the dead enemies, we want to add it to the new enemies list. And then at the very end, we are swapping out the enemies for the new enemies list like that. That's quite a bit of information, but there's going to be some comments and stuff in the GitHub too. So hopefully that'll help out as well. So now what we can do is we can actually run this and see if anything happens. Okay. So the first thing to check is we're going to try to click on an enemy and uh, see what happens here. So we got this big error here and let's see what happens. Invalid memory address or nil pointer. And I know the reason it's because uh, whenever I was, whenever we create the game, uh, we are not actually providing the combat components. So what we have to do here is that whenever we are, let's go into that new game sh uh, function here and let's actually go wherever we're creating our player and let's add in that stuff. So now I'm going to add in the combat component here. This is just going to be the basic combat component. And then instead of there, um, I need to provide the values. And so since they are lowercase, what I actually have to do is I have to create a constructor for it. So I'm gonna say func uh, new basic combat and this is just going to be, you know, another one of those constructor function type things. Um, so this will return a basic combat object here. Um, and what we need to create one is we need the health and the attack power. So the attack power ends like this, return the basic combat with the health and the attack power like that. Okay. And then inside of game, we can then use that here. So whenever we add in that combat component to our player, we can say um, components 
new basic component. And for me, I think that the player's health should be three to start out and the attack power should be one to start out. Why not? For the enemies, we're gonna have to do this for all of them as well. So we're going to basically, I'm just going to rip this here. So I'm gonna say Y, I'm gonna copy that, copy that there, um, paste it there and paste it there. And that should be good to go. Now, whenever we click things, uh, you're not gonna see it initially, but if we click three times, you'll see that that enemy disappears. And then if we click three times, that enemy disappears. What we can actually do is we can add some logging messages too, to show that this is really, really happening. So if, you know, just in case we don't trust the results that we see here. So I'm gonna go to where we did all this and I'm going to say that um, whenever this happens, I'm going to print out that we are damaging the enemy. So damaging, um, enemy here like this and then um, I'm going to basically print out here I'm going to say that the enemy enemy has been eliminated like that and so now we can probably more explicitly see it with the con with the um, terminal logging message here so whenever we click it says damaging enemy and then we can click and click and the enemy has been eliminated etc etc the offensive side has now been added in if not a little bit roughly um, but now let's go ahead and implement in the enemy side. So in order to implement the enemy side, what we need to do is we need to actually add some more information to our combat components. Uh, this is because we need to know when an enemy is actually um, attacking. So what we can do is we can add our combat component here. And what we can do is we can add um, another getter here, and this will be our attacking uh, getter. And this will return a Boolean for whether the enemy or the player are attacking or not. And then what we can do is we can actually, and then what we can do is we can implement it here. So we can just say funk, and this will take in the basic combat like this. And then we will say attacking like this, and this will return a Boolean, which will return. And then inside of our basic combat, we need to add another um, value here. So I'm gonna say that this one is attacking like this. And then, um, we want to have this be a Boolean like that. And we need to change the constructor a little bit because the constructor needs to be able to be told what the value of attacking is. And then inside of attacking, we can return B dot attacking the value that we have right there. So we just added, we basically just added a field to our basic combat for attacking. And then we added this attacking uh, getter here. But what we also need to do is we need to add a method for actually declaring that we are attacking. So while we already have a damage method here, which actually inflicts damage upon, you know, another enemy, um, what we can do here is this will actually signal to ourselves that we are attacking. So this will attack like this. And now what we can do is implement that um, for our basic combat. So we'll do this. I'm actually just going to copy the shell of this function here since it's very similar. And I'm just going to um, get rid of those and get rid of that return statement and like that, whoops, like that. But now what we can do is we can actually do something really, really cool where we can implement our enemies combat because uh, if we do this, if we say that like, for example, the enemy is always attacking, then what we need to do and so now whatever, now inside of our attack function here, what we can say is we can say B dot attacking, um, and then we can say this equals true like that. And then we can add a couple different more things here. Uh, one of them needs to be that we are, um, and then we need to add just one more thing to our combat interface. We need a way to be able to update it over time because for example, we're gonna have things like cooldowns and all that sort of stuff. And so I added that update here and now what we can do is we can implement that last function there. So we'll implement the update like that. So update here. And for the basic combat, it's not going to do anything. Uh, but what now what we're going to do is we're going to leverage um, Go's powerful structs to actually create something really, really cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new struct specifically for our enemies here. And I'm going to call it my type. It's going to be my um, enemy combat struct. So enemy combat struct like this. Um, and then we can do this thing here. And inside of here, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to, without naming, it, I'm going to actually put in the basic combat like this. And what you can find now is that if we take this thing here, which verifies 
if our which verifies if our struct has satisfied the conditions of the interface if we change this to our enemy comment here you'll notice that there are absolutely no, no errors, even though I have implemented zero methods for our enemy combat struct here. So that's really, really cool. We can basically just almost like inheritance, we can just take the methods that have been implemented for this thing that's embedded and we can just say they're mine now so there you go uh, but what's even what's even cooler is we can now override things and so what i can say is i can say that now an enemy is going to have an attack cooldown this is just going to be an int value and then we're going to say um time since attack which is also going to be an int value like that and now what we can do is we can override a couple things. So we can say um, func, and then we can say b, and then we can say well, then we can say e, and then we can say enemy combat like this. And then what we can say is we can say attack. So we're overriding the functionality of the original attack method like that. And then what we'll say is we'll say if the time since attack is greater than or equal to the um, attack cooldown here. So attack cooldown, then we want to say that attacking is true like that. And also whenever we first, whenever we attack, now we need to say time since attack is going to be equal to zero because we are resetting our cooldown timer. So this means that we also now need to have some update functionality so that we can progress this timer. So we'll say our enemy combat here, and then we'll have our update here. And then we'll have inside of there, we'll say that the E dot time since attack, and this is going to be, um, plus equals just one for now. The reason we're able to just put a raw value of one is because is because we are using a fixed update loop because we're using Evit Engine. Okay, so I think that's it for a basic implementation. What we can now do is go to our enemy, swap out the basic combat here for the um, enemy combat, for the enemy combat like that. And then also one more thing is that I can create a, we can create a sh function for creating this enemy combat. So I'll create a new function called new enemy combat. And this will just return a new enemy combat struct, which will, you know, return an enemy combat struct like that. And then for that, we'll do a new basic, we'll do a new basic combat here. And so what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need health, attack power, and the attack cooldown which are just all ints like that. So we can now pass in the health and the attack power like that. And then we can, for the attack cooldown, we'll pass in that attack cooldown there. And then for the times to attack, it, you know, the, the thing hasn't existed yet. So it's gonna be zero. Okay, so now inside of our game, we can go to our new game function, go to where we are creating our, um, we can go to where we're creating our enemies, and instead of creating new basic combats, we're going to create uh, new enemy combats here. And then for the attack cooldown, I'm going to set it to like maybe like 30 because we're gonna do like 60 frames a second, so that's about half a second. Um, and so now we can just set that to three zero, and then same thing here. Um, so like that, so new enemy combat like this, and then I'll set this one to uh, 30 as well. And so now inside of our update, back where we are handling the enemy interactions here, at the top we need to say enemy dot combat component dot update here, and make sure that that's, that's happening as well. And then for our player, we'll say g dot player dot combat component dot update like that. There is one thing that I did forget, so sorry about that. There is one more thing that we need to add to our combat here. Uh, what we need to do is we need our combat fu function to actually return a Boolean, whether we were able to successfully attack or not. And so for the enemy combat, this is going to be if the time since attack was, is greater than the cooldown, then we have attacked and we can return true here. Otherwise, we just want to return false because we weren't able to attack. The other implementation for the basic one here, which is going to be right here, um, since it always happens, we're going to just return true no matter what, like that. And then we need to also change the signature for that to work as well. Okay, yes, we have quite a lot of things that our, our combat interface needs to implement, uh, but this just makes it so that we're going to have a more robust interface for working with uh, combat systems. So now what we can do is we can actually check for the enemies attacking the player. And, we, and, and for now, we're just going to make it so that when the enemy runs into the player or the player runs into the enemy, um, the enemy does damage to the player. So kind of like a Super Mario type of thing. You just They just have like a lethal hitbox or something. 
And so what we can say is, we can say, um, we can first check, does the enemy's wrecked collide with the player's wrecked? And so for that, we need to actually create the player's wrecked. So I'm gonna go up here, and I'm gonna say the player wrecked, I'm gonna call it P wrecked here. And I'm going to essentially just take this, so take that wrecked here, and I'm gonna put it up here, so P wrecked like that. And then for all of these, so now we've created the player's wrecked, and what we'll say is we'll just have a check here. Luckily, the wrecked struct that we're using has a built-in for checking collisions because that's a little more involved than the cursor one. So we'll say um, if wrecked dot, and then what we need to do is we need to say over, I think it's overlaps. Yeah, overlaps checks if they do overlap. So if wrecked overlaps with our player's wrecked here, if enemy overlaps player, so we'll want to say if enemy dot combat components dot attack if enemy dot combat component dot attack that means that if this is true then we want to actually damage the player so then we'll say g dot player dot combat component dot damage and then we want to damage it by an amount and so for that amount is going to be the value of enemy dot combat component dot attack power like this and then we can add our check. We can say if g dot player dot combat component dot health is is less than or equal to zero, then we want to for now let's just print out because we don't really have like a, a start of our game, but we can just print out like uh, player has died like that. So maybe like that. And so that can be sufficient for notifying us that the player has died. Try this out to see if that stuff works. So we can go run dot this. And I'm getting some um, issues here. Okay, it was just an issue of me not saving my thing. Um, but as you can see, the player is dying a lot because the enemy runs after me right away. Um, but I can subtract from the health. And so let's see. I, for I totally forgot about something. And that was translating the cursor's position into um, the actual world position because I forgot that whenever you move around with the camera uh, it actually it does change the position that we are looking for whenever we're checking for collisions and so there is actually a really easy uh, fix for this what we can do is we can just say like cx and then we want to add on so we want to do a uh, plus equals and then we want to do g dot the camera the x value like this we want to basically just add on the x and the y value of the camera to the x and the y value of the cursor like that and it should actually be a um, minus not a plus so whoopsies so let's go ahead and move down here and there you go even though we're over here we can still take out our enemies so now it's relative to that position it would probably be helpful as well if we had a print statement for um, whenever we damage the player but don't kill it. So I'm gonna do, let's say like player damaged, um, and then we'll say the health is going to be value here. And then we'll do it in a sprintf like this. And then we'll add in the g.player.health like that. Okay, so now we have a little bit of a print statement for whenever, whenever that happens, so that's pretty good. So now as you can see, we have some print statements for, you know, two, one, zero, and so we have died. So that's exactly what we want to see. Now it is going in the negatives, but in the actual game, you know, you would reset the game for these type of things. Now one last thing before we go, um, for the, right now the player has infinite range, which is not exactly what I want. I kind of want the player to be sort of realistic and they only have a certain amount of range. And so to mitigate that, what we can do is we can just check the distance between the cursor and the player. Um, and then from that we can say, is it within the correct amount of, of range? If so, then we want to um, attack, otherwise just don't do anything. And so what we'll do is we'll create a new function here so we'll say um, and now what we need to do is we need to have the distance formula here so you need to whip out your algebra one memory here so we need to do math dot square root and then inside of the square root we need a couple things so we need a math dot power function i think that exists in there so we can do that we need it in two spots we need it one for the x and one for the y and then we need the x2 minus x1 y2 minus y1 here is inside of the math.pow for the first one, we will say the cx is going to be minus the g.player.x here. 
And then for the power, we're going to do it to the power of two, because that's how the formula goes. And then the same thing for this. So it's going to be CY, um, and that's going to be minus G dot player dot Y, and then to the power of two. Um, and now one more thing we need to do is we need to add on half of a tile size because this is relative to the top left of the player. We need to add on the constant dot tile size here divided by two. We also need to do that for the first one. Add on the constant dot tile size divided by two, which I need to wrap in parentheses like that. And then this should not be a comma here between the powers. It should be a plus sign like that. And the math of square root thing needs to actually be a check. So if it's within, and the, you know, we just threw it in if statement, but what we need to do is we need to make sure that it's within a range. So I'm just gonna say, if it's less than, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do constants.tile size, like maybe, um, and then maybe I'm gonna do like constants.tile size times like five here, or maybe five like that. And maybe that's like a good range. That'll be about five tiles, you know, around in a circle around the player. And we can go like pretty far away and we can say like, are you getting damaged? Um, they're not getting damaged. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click the one close to me and I'm damaging it and it's dead. Um, and so this one's not being damaged. We can go very close to it and it's still not being damaged. We can go even closer and it's being damaged now. And now it's been eliminated. So now the player has some range. So it's a little more realistic. So that was quite a bit of code and I wasn't quite able to get things organized as far as this code goes, uh, but I'm looking at the recorder and I'm currently sitting at one hour of recording time. So that's where I've got to end today's video. Um, this was some basic combat introduced. Yeah, there's no animations and stuff, but we have a really good system to work off of for working with combat in the future. Later on, we will add things like, like attack animations and uh, different like defense and effects and all these sort of things. But for now, we need to get the ground laid first. And so that's what we did in this video. Hopefully you enjoyed and learned something new. Um, and if you appreciate this video, make sure to like and subscribe. Also consider joining my Discord where there are a ton of developers there. It's a happy community where you can ask a ton of questions and just enjoy talking to other programmers. And also consider supporting me on Patreon so I can continue making videos like this. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day. See ya.